Ladies and gentlemen, General Myers. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, it's a real privilege to be here. Uh, an absolute honor and surprise to be the recipient of, of this particular award, uh, the money of which goes right back to the Academy to programs that are important here at the United States Air Force Academy. So I'm just proud to be the conduit uh, to enhance programs here because this is a really important institution. Uh, I will guarantee you we'll have time for some questions. Um, and I got a clock up there. I think I can read that pretty well and we'll just um, hopefully you got some, uh, some things you might want to ask. It'd be on any subject. It can be, how's Kansas State University different than the academy? You all know that anyway. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, but in essence, not. We're still trying to, to turn good young people out and become great citizens of this country and, and of the world. So I thought what I'd do at first is uh, talk, uh, to lead into the, the, ma the main part of my presentation, it's about uh, kind of why I stayed in the military. So I went to Kansas State University. ROTC was mandatory. You don't know about those days, but in those days at the land grant schools, it was mandatory. I had to get in a line. I went into one of our field houses and they had two lines, Army and Air Force. And I, no, nobody in my family served. And I said, okay, Army, Air Force, walk to war, fly to war, walk to war. I settled on flying to war. Um, and, and for not a good reason, other than I, I did like airplanes, and I'd you know, kind of grown up around some, and we had Richard Gabauer at the time, an active Air Defense Command base with very just beautiful silver F-86s. So I was entranced by all that. Uh, but I went in ROTC, I said, well, I'm only going to do the two mandatory years. I will not do the last two years, the senior course. And the Vietnam draft was raging, and I did not particularly want to get drafted. I didn't mind serving, of course, so I, so I said, I'll, I want more of a choice. So I went into the senior part. They, in those days, they taught you to fly while you were in ROTC. If you were pilot qualified, they'd, they'd teach you to fly. And you could get a private license. And uh, that first flight in a September day, when we broke ground, that, that changed everything. Changed my life forever because that was, I liked everything about it. We were in a little bitty airplane, we were bouncing around in the wind, but I liked the way it smelled, the way it sounded. I like, man, I could see, see a lot better up here. All of that as a young guy, and I was in engineering, by the way, that was my, my, my field of study, but this made a lot more, this was a lot more fun than engineering, let me just say that. And um, I don't know, engineering's important, I did have fun in engineering, I guess, but this was really fun. Yeah, you got that. This was really, really fun. And then went in and thought, well, I'll go in for five years, I'll get out, and stayed for 40. Let me tell you why I stayed. Let me tell you why I stayed and why you're probably gonna wanna stay and it'll lead into my uh, little bit of the presentation that I'm gonna go through fairly quickly. Um, first of all, there's nothing more important that you could be doing, in my view, for you, your family, or our country than what you're doing right now, and that's going through the United States Air Force Academy, you're gonna graduate some June, you're gonna get uh, your lieutenant bars on, and you're gonna go out and you're gonna, you're gonna help make us secure. This is really important because there are a lot of people out there that don't want us to be around. There are a lot of people that would like to threaten our constitution, our way of life. We've the, we're the most successful country on earth. I'm not saying the best, but we're the most successful. I think we're the best in many ways, but we're the most successful country. And part of that success is you and the people that sat, have sat here before you and that have served before you. You know that a lot of you, I know a lot of you have family members that have served, but this is so, so important. And that's the culture you're going into, one where you've got to be ready to defend your country in many different ways. You might do it in an airplane, you might do it, as I did later in life, at a, sitting on my rear in the Pentagon. I mean, you don't know where, it's going to, where you're going to serve or how you're going to serve, but it's going to take all you have to do it right and keep our country free. So I appreciate you, I appreciate the fact you've signed up for not an easy education, not an easy educational experience, but you've signed up for that, and you've, I mean, you continue, continue to impress, impress all of us. Um, I, like, I like the culture of, of the military in other ways as well. So I've talked about serving your country, that's one way. Uh, I'm gonna go to my first slide here. Uh, I'm gonna use three words to talk about the military culture. Uh, they're not three words that I dreamed up, you'll see the words, but uh, the words are 
for those of you that have some disabilities, the word, the big word is the word, that's honor. Uh, and around that I put some, and, and you could add your own things around honor uh, in terms of um, what you think it means. It means a lot of things. But why I like the military, one of the words I put up there was uh, integrity. You know, the military is, is unique, I think, and that it's one of the few places where integrity is absolutely essential if you're going to be successful and if you're going to get the mission done. Absolutely essential. Now, every industry, private sector, I've, been, I've done some of that. It, it's important everywhere in life. But it's mandatory in the United States military. It's mandatory in the United States Air Force. And you find out, and you've already found out, you've already experienced this. You know who you can trust, who you can't trust, who is a person of the word, who doesn't keep their word, who will get, keep going when it gets tough, who's going to get the mission done. Um, that's all about your personal integrity. Such an important word, so important to military service. And let me tell you, you've already found out, because you've, you've been here for a couple of years now, you've, you've found out that the people that don't have it don't last very long, right? Um, fortunately, most of you have it, or you wouldn't be here in the first place. But you'll see as you get out and you get in the real Air Force, as they say, you're going to see that uh, those that don't have it don't last very long. I'd like to be part of a, an organization that counted on me, that wanted they wanted to trust me, and I wanted to be trustworthy. And by the way, integrity, trust is part of those words I have up there. Trust is such an important ingredient as well. How do you get things done in the world, whether it's the military or whatever? How do you do it? You do it through human relationships. What are relationships built upon? Trust. So you have to have a trusting relationship with other humans, other people to get anything done. That all goes back to integrity. If you're going to be successful, United States military, you've got to be a person of honor. And all these words apply. Probably other words that I didn't put up there, I've got about doing the right thing, ethical, uh, service, pride. You've got to have pride in the sense that you've got to be proud of what you can, uh, of your work. Uh, do it right so you're proud of it. Your word is your bond. Uh, let me take on courage as another word up there for just a minute. There are lots of kinds of courage. There's physical courage and there's moral courage. They're both really important. I was lucky enough as a president of K-State to participate in March Madness as a fan and watch the K-State men's basketball team kind of go through up to the Elite Eight. Um, at the Elite Eight we got beat by uh, Loyola of Chicago. In the locker room it, in the locker room it was uh, the student athletes were they were just in misery. But as we tried to pump it back up and so forth, um, you realize that at that level of competition, it takes real toughness, both mental toughness and physical toughness. And the teams that do the best are probably the best at the mental toughness and the physical uh, toughness. Courage is the same thing. It takes mental toughness often and certainly many times physical toughness. Later in my career, it was more on the on the mental part, early part of the career of Vietnam, maybe more on the, on the physical part of toughness. But being tough, being able to persist, to keep going when the odds are against you or you're not feeling well or something hurts or whatever, that's what, that's what counts. So this whole notion of honor, one of the big words, I think, that defines who we are as a, a military culture, who we, who we want to be. I'm just going to mention... Um, one more, and that's the ethical dimension. Maybe two more. Ethical dimension. Um, for 10 years after I retired from the Air Force, I uh, taught with a real academician, and we taught a, an ethics course for, at the National Defense University. So it was National War College students. It was um, Eisenhower School students. It was some from the counterterrorism school. We had uh, one person in there from Ukraine, actually, in one of our classes. And I, I remember him distinctly because at the end of the course critique, of course, everybody has to fill one out here like you probably do, but we also ask for verbal critiques. Tell us what we did well, what we didn't do well, how, how can we make it better next time? And um, he said, you know, when he came his turn to critique our course, he says, you know, um, when I signed up for this course, I thought it was on ethnic studies, not ethical studies. He says, despite that, I really liked it. And, uh, 
So we had some, we, it was an interesting course. The Ukrainian did a great job, by the way, and he, he wrote one of the better papers. We have papers that are part of the course. He did, did one of the better, better papers, even though he thought he was going to study ethnic studies. I don't know what he thought he was going to study, but that was what he thought. Um, the ethical dimension of our service is really important, and I would just caution you on this. And this is from a lot of experience and probably flunking this at times. You, you know, when you want to do things ethically uh, right, morally right, consistent with your values that you've grown up with through school, through church, through whatever, through the United States Air Force Academy, um, sometimes the ends you want to get to are, are really noble. But you've got to occasionally step back and, and evaluate whether the means that you're using to get to those ends are also ethical and moral. This is a problem in every profession. I don't think it's not more prevalent in the military. It's probably less prevalent in the military. But one that's capturing some headlines today is uh, Fat Leonard and the, the Navy out in, in the Pacific. And I don't know if you've been keeping up with that, but it's got, I think the number of 60 admirals kind of caught up in this thing. And not all have done wrong things, but are, have to be looked at to see if their interaction with Fat Leonard a contractor providing services to the Navy out in Westpac um, was, was the right or wrong thing to do. So I just, every once in a while, you get so busy working so hard. You work, you know, you're on, you're on, you're working all night long. You get tired. You've got this goal you're trying to reach for. If you don't step back just to, every once in a while and say, are we doing this the right way? Then you might blunder in. I don't think people actually set out to do wrong things, but you might blunder in uh, to something that's either unethical or, or immoral. And so just, just like the new building, you gotta, you gotta be oriented to True North all the time, just like that plaque, wherever that is. That'll be a good reminder. True North is where we wanna kinda be pointing, and uh, we all wander, but we gotta get back there, and the faster we get back there, the better our military, our military will be. Um, courage. Moral courage, doing the right thing. I'll give you one, one little story. Um, when I was commandant of the uh, weapons school at Nellis Air Force Base, uh, they have a selection process down in San Antonio that's part of the personnel process. I mean, it's a formal board. And um, when I got off the airplane, got to San Antonio, met the uh, person that was going to host us and set up our board, uh, my biggest worry was where we're going to get Mexican food tonight and what kind of beer we're going to drink. And he said, oh, I've got this letter from one of our numbered Air Force commanders. So I'm a colonel. I'm the commandant of this weapons school. I'm the, the board chair. There are lots of other board members. And the rules are that you can't influence the selection process. It's set out in the personnel regs and you can't interfere with it. And I got this letter from a three star and I didn't know what it was about, didn't expect it, opened it up. And he identified himself, he says, um, my number one choice for the F-15, this is before the F-15E, okay, so but for the F-15 um, program is so-and-so. Well, unfortunately, that person came from a wing where he was not the number one choice. He was number four because he was a young guy, time, he'll get there, so forth. So my question was, in trying to do the right thing, do we just let the board happen? and not mention the three stars input, which was inappropriate, illegal in a way, or do we try to accommodate the three star? Uh, my decision, I made, I, made, I made two decisions. One was, we're gonna do the right thing, the board's gonna go ahead and do what it does. And I called my wife, Mary Jo, and said, is your teaching certificate up to date? Because this may be our last official act. You never know, I mean, and you never know. And so, but I, I, it was important enough to do it the right way for, for the United States Air Force, so we did it. We had the board. He didn't come out on the list, and I called my wing commander, who was a one-star. I said, uh, Tom, uh, here's the way it worked out. He says, oh my goodness, that's awful. This is a... I said, no, I'll call. I'll call the three-star. This will be fine. I called the three-star, and I said, uh, sir, I appreciate your letter. Uh, first, let me say that you know, we can't use that kind of information to the board. Uh, and your man didn't make it, and so sorry about that, but he's a great contender for next year, and that was, those were my last words, and the conversation lasted for about 25 minutes, uh, but it was the fellow on the other end of the line who said, uh, 
His first words were, I guess being a three-star United States Air Force doesn't mean much anymore. And uh, of course, he didn't expect me to comment. I didn't have a comment. Uh, and then he went on from there. Uh, it all resolved itself okay. I didn't get fired or booted. I actually, I actually got a... By the way, this guy was a numbered Air Force commander. They're the ones that own all the airplanes. I wanted to be a wing commander someday. At least I thought maybe I was capable. Uh, he was going to have to give me a wing. And uh, you didn't want to irritate him too badly. I finally got a wing and all that sort of stuff, and things seemed to work out okay. But uh, that takes another kind of courage that I, I had to show. And I'm not saying I was particularly courageous. It was easy to do the right thing. It's always easy. It's easier to do that than to figure out any other way around it. So military culture, so important for what we do for our country. And, and three factors that I, I, I think about all the time, three, three key words. The first one is honor. And... Um, and that's what the American public expects of you, too. It expects all these things. Next word is humility. You might not expect it up there. How does that go with courage? How does it go with toughness, persistence, and all those sorts of things? Um, the best leaders I've seen have a pretty healthy dose of humility. The first thing it, it brings to you as a person is a realization that you, and appreciation that you can't do this alone. You can't do this by yourself. And there are those that think they can. And at some level in life, you can do it all by yourself. And for some period of time, you can do it by yourself. But if you're going to do it for a long period of time, you can't do it by yourself. Everybody, everybody needs to count. Um, the one on the lower right, it's so subdued you might not see it. Uh, nobody more important than anyone else. That came out of some of the, the quality work done in the early 90s and mid-90s which is another subject, but that was, I like that. Nobody is more important than anybody else. So I'm on our leadership studies building on our K-State campus, which is a very nice modern building, and uh, getting ready to have a, a meeting, a conference in there. And I went into the, the restroom, and there was a fellow that was cleaning the toilets. And he was, um, um, looked like a regular custodian kind of guy. And of course, you, you you know, most of us being human, you start to make judgments about who is this guy, what's he do, so forth. And, um, and I was just curious. I mean, here's a custodian cleaning toilets for my benefit, right? My benefit, I get to use that clean restroom. And so we started talking. And the, and the more we talked, I actually became late to the conference, because the more you talk, his contribution to society is probably greater than mine. He, is a, he was an African-American man, um, raised his family, lots of foster children, adopted some of the foster children. I don't know how many children he had, but it's somewhere just short of 10 that he's fostered or adopted. And he told me where they were all in school. And he's just a custodian wiping out the urinals. Are you kidding me? So the point is, nobody is more important than anybody else. And when you think you are, then you're not much use in my, my view. And people will figure that out because when you start thinking you're the most important thing around, um, you'll get your comeuppance one way or another. Um, humility, an important, a really, I think, important trait in how we think about ourselves and how we fit into things. And there's no job beneath you. You'll all graduate from the Air Force Academy. You're, everybody's gonna know who you are when you show up on a base. This is an Air Force Academy graduate, new lieutenant. Um, they're going to know who you are. And, and you're going to be given some jobs that you may think are beneath your dignity. I know I was when I got to Ramstein Air Base as a new F-4 pilot. I was, a, let's see, maybe a, maybe a first lieutenant by then. And they made me the snack bar officer. I said, wait a minute. I'm a mechanical engineer. Got that degree right here. I just went through flight training. I did really well at flight training. I was number two in my class. I blew them away at RTU. I'm the snacko? So the story goes on. I'm the snacko. I didn't ever say that to anybody. I said it to myself. I said it when I went to sleep at night. I said, snacko? I went through all this to be the snack bar officer? So the squadron commander puts his arm around me one morning and says, listen, we got the general, general's coming down from higher headquarters. He's going to be here at 8 o'clock, and you're the snacko. I want you to have this coffee bar shaped up. I want two fresh pots of coffee. I want every coffee cup 
on this bar, cleaned up. I said, got it, sir. And I did all that. I had two fresh pots of coffee. I don't know if you have your own coffee bars, but nobody ever cleans up the coffee cups. So I actually washed them all out and got them sitting up there. They actually didn't look like they had some kind of disease in the bottom of them. And um, you know those kind of coffee cups, right? Probably your personal one, like mine. And uh, got all that cleaned up. Big mistake I made was about 15 minutes ago, I ducked in the, the restroom, ducked in, came back out. All the flights that were briefing had finished briefing. They were on their way to the airplane. They all stopped by the coffee bar. They drank all the coffee, dirtied all the cups, made a mess out of the place. And I had, and the generals now reported to be turning down our, we had a long driveway into our area coming. I ran with uh, two pots, of, the two pots, the two empty pots. I ran next to the, there was an exchange little place right next door. We still had concertina wire in those days. Maybe we were still doing some places. Made my way around all that, went into the exchange to their big coffee pots and started filling them up. And the lady behind the counter says, what are you doing? I said, I'm filling these two coffee pots. I'll be right back in about half an hour and I'll pay for it all. Don't worry. I just got to ran back, got them in place, got the coffee cups up there, they looked clean, and I guess passed. Uh, it all went okay, but so no job is beneath you unless the squadron commander thinks it's really important to have coffee, clean coffee cups for his boss who's coming down to look at the squadron. Um, you'll get those kind of jobs. I've had several of them where I thought, this is the end of my career. I'm done. They're sending me off to somewhere. You never know. Nothing is beneath you. The Air Force has lots of really important jobs. They need really good people to do them. I tried to be the best snacko I could be. Um, I must have passed because then they put me in a position, additional duty that was a lot, lot better. I was, went to the weapon shop. Some people know about that's, that's a good place to be. At least you, they get, you get a little more respect than you do as the snacko. Um, but it takes a little humility to go through all that. Not a bad trait. Think about the leaders that you, you have as role models. Think about the people you like. Um, think about the people that even, even give you a hard time. If they have a little, a little uh, humility in there, it's a lot easier to take. And the last word of my three H's, honor, humility, is humor. Um, my rule is when I interview somebody for a job, if I can't detect some sense of humor, a sliver of a sense of humor, I won't hire them. I don't know what it is. It's just... I find it difficult to trust somebody that can't laugh. Laugh at themselves, laugh. There's lots of ways to display your humor. Um, I think it's an important ingredient to get through life because life is not a straight line like this. Life is ups and downs and ups and downs. I bet if you plotted your ups and downs here at the United States Air Force Academy, it looked like somebody having a heart attack. Um, there have been some ups and downs, right? I mean, that's what, that's what life is. And it doesn't change. It doesn't change as you go through this. It doesn't change when you're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and your, your brother dies one night back in Las Vegas and you're attending some important function in your mess dress in Washington. I mean, there's ups and downs and there's starts and stops. Humor is, is what makes us all human. Although I know my dogs laugh. I know dogs laugh. I, I could tell it. Um, that's not ha ha ha, but I know at least they smile. I know dogs smile, but generally they, they ascribe humor to, the, to humans. It's what makes us human, and uh, it can be used in really effective ways. One of the most, some of the most frightening times as chairman was going in front of the Secretary of Defense trying to get what we call deployment orders, what troops and, and, and units we're going to send overseas to Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever in the world, they were very tense meetings, very tense. They would sometimes get so tense that we weren't making any progress. He was asking questions that you couldn't answer at the end, you know, like, why is there error? I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, we'll have to go research that, but we don't know why there's not error. So I would usually sacrifice myself, sometimes one of my Army two or three-star buddies that was sitting there trying to brief him, uh, or Air Force guy, it didn't matter. But Norty Schwartz, former chief of staff of the Air Force, more, I, I sacrificed him a lot of times. I'd make fun of Norty. I'd say something, and if I could see the Secretary of All Defense just start to smile a little bit, I knew we were going to get back to, to normal. It can really diffuse tense situations. You probably used it yourself. It applies all the way up to the White House, to the Pentagon, wherever. Humor works. It works in other cultures. 
mostly, not all the time. At least it'll get a strange look, and you can go from there and get back to where you want to be. Um, I think it's a really important trait. It, it is one of those little bullets there. It does, does help in avoid being too self-important. And I use Mary Jo's here today, and Mary Jo, my wife of, uh, will soon be 43 years, um, she can keep me honest in lots of ways, and humor is one of them. I don't know what she's going to say after this, but I'm sure I'll have some comments on the way back to uh, <laughs> lodging. Um, but it, and usually it will be in a humorous way, or at least she thinks it's funny. Uh, that's it except for questions and discussions. Let me just go back to the beginning again, just for a second, and talk about how important it is that you do what you do. That some of you have seen it, but not all of you have seen all of it, but there are people that would like to do away with our way of life in lots of different ways. And the ways are becoming more insidious, more dangerous all the time. And with, uh, with weapons of mass destruction and the technology around all of that, um, it could happen when you've, when you've put on your rank and you're out there doing what you're going to do. You've got to be ready for that. You've got, to be, you've got to steel yourself to the fact that you have a really important job to protect us. And you've got to have the courage to do that. You've got to have the persistence to do that. Just the toughness to do that. Talk to people that have been deployed and how, how it takes a certain amount of toughness to do what you do day in and day out. And persistence. And courage, both moral and physical. And then I would say, as you aspire to leadership, think about the three H's. Think about honor, your honor, what you bring to the equation. Humility, a trait that will serve you well, and as always, a sense of humor. That'd be, that'd be my, my, those are my, I guess, suggestions. So with that, I think we've got actually plenty of time for questions and answers, and I hope you have some questions. They can be on any subject, by now, you must know who's going to be the first one to the mic, right? You're not going to be surprised. Somebody's going to run down. You've seen it before. If you haven't, and if I don't see anything, I will, I will announce here in a minute that I have a prize. A prize for the first one to the mic. It's going to have to come in the mail in a few days, but I'll get you a prize. You're wondering what it is? Well, you've got to come down to the mic and earn it. While they're working their way down here, I have a test question. How many years have we been married? <laughs> so, so my wife has a hearing problem, and what she, didn't, what she didn't hear was, I said, soon to be 43 years. Is that right? What am I not adding up right? Let's see. <laughs> oh no, we, we haven't been married that long. <laughs> well, answer the test question. I'm so sorry, which decade are you forgetting? <laughs> Is it 53 years? Oh my gosh. Oh. Okay. I told you I would get some help and it'd be somewhat humorous. She thinks she's pretty funny. So. Okay, who earns the prize? Good afternoon, sir. C3C Thompson from CS14. Ima. Ima. <laughs> I was really close to coming to K State before I came here. I applied Southwest okay. Kansas, so go K State. Go Cats, yep. Um, so, my question is about Kansas State. What is your favorite part about Kansas State or just Kansas in general? <laughs> <laughs> well, the favorite thing about Kansas State for me is, and the only reason I'm there is the importance of higher education and, frankly, the students and interacting with them. And so that's 
That's what's kind of, that's what keeps me young. I wouldn't do it if I weren't a Kansan. I wouldn't do it if I weren't a graduate. It's, um, we have a lot of challenges like a lot of higher education does these days, but it's, it's really the students. And I would add the faculty, it's just everybody there, the people there are uh, fun to work with. Not always easy, but fun. Uh, students very involved in our governance, by the way. We have uh, what we call shared governance. And I'll just give you one example. Before we can propose to the Board of Regents any tuition increases, we do that every May, or fee increases, uh, Student Government Association reviews them all and they vote. The Student Government vote on and then that's passed to me and I go to Topeka with our request and I can differ if I want to. I can say disregard the students. I think it ought to be this. I do that at my own peril and it's generally not very wise actually because the regents would listen to the students before they listen to the president and on this particular topic. And so, I mean, it's, we have a very close relationship between students, administration, and it's just fun. I mean, it's fun to be on a campus. And I wish you to come, no, I'm, I'm glad you're here actually. This is great. And uh, I know you're prospering here. You would have prospered uh, there as well. So your, your prize, I need your, your uh, mailing address and your prize will come in the mail. It will remain a secret. Well, you'll like it. Actually, you're the perfect person. So. Uh, you are the perfect person because uh, the challenge coin, so I decided K-State president needed a challenge coin. So I've got a challenge coin that has the power cut on one side, um, something, the seal on the other side, uh, of course my name, somehow four stars wound up on there too. And uh, I'll send you one of those in the mail and you can show it around Kansas and get a little credibility when you go back. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Fifty-three years, really? It seems like just only yesterday. Good afternoon, sir. My name is. Um, I got to work on this all night. This is tough. This is going to be tough tonight. This is going to be tough. <laughs> Hope not too tough. Um, my name is TTC Ben Smith, and I'm also from Quadrant 14. And my question was, what have you found has helped your students the best to stay motivated to do their best in classes and to work hard? Like, well, how do you help your students out the best or the most that way? Well, it, it's, um, I don't, so we have a lot of things. One of the things we're really focused on at Kansas State is student success and our rates are pretty good. They're, they're better than most universities nationwide. I mean, we do very well at that. We don't do well in certain areas. So for our minority populations, uh, more diverse students don't do as well. Uh, we have a huge effort to fix that because that's not gonna, that's not tolerable. Um, but I think it's just convincing people that th this is your one chance to, to do this. Nobody's gonna go start as a freshman again and build a, <laughs> a GPA record. So this is your one chance. And if you wanna have chances later on, uh, your chance for success is to do the best you can while you're doing it. By the way, that came to me actually a little late. And I, I was fairly successful in the, the Air Force. I'd been through the weapons school, which is, uh, as some of you may know, uh, it was a pretty big cut just to get to the weapons school. I'd been through that, but I found out I had another gear that I hadn't been using to, be, to try to be even better, and it happened actually when my father died. And something, something happened that said, you know, I've got to, I've got to give every minute to, to being the best I can be in whatever I'm doing. Uh, that's when it dawned on me. I, don't, I think everybody kind of matures differently, uh, but we have lots of... Um, and that's why I like to go to the student union and I'll just wander through it and you'll wind up in conversations that can be helpful in this regard, talking to students. They'll have those kind of questions, other questions. And I hope I can be motivational to them and trying to, I mean, I don't want them to see my transcript. I'm just lucky that, you know, back when the dean called me and said, you're now going to be an alumni fellow, I thought he was going to take my, my degree away. I thought, why is the dean calling me 20 years later? What's this about? Did I not make one of those courses that I thought I passed? And, but it, I mean, really, I, I had nightmares. You won't have that, you'll know clearly, but at K-State, maybe there was some chance I didn't do something right. But I think you just gotta explain to people how important this is and, and, and to always give your best. I mean, I understood it in an athletic way, uh, I think in an academic way, and then in, later in life, I had to redouble my efforts. And we always can give more. We can always do better. There's, there's examples, examples, examples of, Mary Jo, what was that, that young lady that, uh, uh, T tell the story. Get, tell the story about the young lady, that, the, the runner, the runner. The young lady, the, 
The young lady that the coach had to catch at the finish line. Maybe they've heard the story, but tell the story. He's getting back at me, isn't he? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll try to make this succinct. Real succinct. Real succinct. It uh, was a young high school student in South Carolina, North Carolina, and she was uh, a really tough soccer player, loved soccer, often got ca cautioned by the coaches to just tone it down a bit. And she was diagnosed with MS and, of course, was unable to continue. How old was she then, 15? She, yeah, 15, 16. She was in high school, so she joined the track team. She told the coach what issues she had, and he said, Somebody asked him what kind of a runner she was after she'd been there. And he said, well, I think if she continues to work hard, she could make varsity by her senior year. I'm sorry, this kind of chokes me up to talk about it because it's just such an amazing story. But anyway, she just really doubled down on her efforts. And she, oh, to mention, besides having MS, she was five foot tall. And she became this incredible runner and won all kinds of races in North Carolina. I mean, even long distance wide. races. And now she has a scholarship to a college in North Carolina. But MS, the symptoms really kick in when the body gets overheated. And by the time she'd finish, be close to the finish of a race, her legs would be numb. She couldn't even feel it, but she could keep running. And when she'd passed the finish line, she had no way to cool down easily. I mean, she would collapse. Her coach would have to catch her carry her off the field and she'd be ice, ice, water, water, and they'd have to ice her down to get her back to, to normal. It didn't do permanent harm, but the strength that she showed and the, just the tenacity was absolutely amazing. So thank you, Mary. So yeah, that, that deserves an applause. Thank you. The, the point is when you think you're giving it 100% or doing your best, there's another gear there. I'm sure there's still another gear for me. I mean, I, there's, there's just, there's, you can just do better. And we all have to strive to do that. So that'd be my answer. It's, it's hard to, when people are ready, they're ready. And uh, you can encourage, but, and I think here, the, 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 the peers and the colleagues can be helpful uh, in that as well. And that, that would motivate me to be here in a squadron and seeing how people are doing. And I'm sure a lot of people know what your GPA is and how you're doing in classes. And uh, that's useful. That, that, it's good to have a little pressure. Thank you. On, on this side. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is CGC Clark. I'm from uh, Manhattan, Kansas, uh, about Whoa. Half, uh, northeast of Goodnow. Okay. Um, my question to you, sir, how do you think the uh, Cats are going to do this following football season? Hopefully back. Well, you might appreciate this. This is closer to home. So when I got there, in fact, it was Coach Snyder, our, our all, all Hall of Fame coach, that said, uh, Dick, you really ought to stay at K-State. As I was the interim president at the time. I said, I'd agree to be interim. I'm not going to be the full-time. I don't have time for that. I'm getting ready to cut back on a lot of things in life. And I told Coach Snyder, who's three years older than me, I, I said, Coach, I'm too old to stay here and do that. And he gave me this quizzical look. And I, then I realized, oops, he's three years older. And OK. So um, later that season, in the middle of not last season, the one before that, I said, Coach, you know, I'm an Air Force guy. Uh, why don't we ever play the Air Force Academy? <laughs> exactly. That's what he says. He says, if you want to go on, take on their offense, we don't see that offense anywhere in the Big 12. Nobody runs that offense. It, it, we'd have to spend so much time preparing them, we'd probably still lose. That's not what we're going to do. So, so if you want to do it, you can become the head coach. You go do that. But I'm not going to do it. So. He's a smart man, so probably never, but I'm gonna, every year I'll mention it to him. Maybe he'll do it just to be nice one year. I don't think so, but you know. Thank you, good question. Yep. Afternoon, sir, I'm C2C Juan Duque from Squadron 27. And my question is, uh, as a young officer, did you find it challenging to work with the higher leadership who over the years when the Air Force and the military evolves weren't as tactful, as close to the tactful level of uh, the, the fight as, as you were? Um, you know, that was a real problem in the United States Air Force. It was particularly prevalent in the Viet Vietnam era because a lot of people were going to Vietnam, senior people, lieutenant colonels and colonels, who weren't very tactically proficient. I'm not saying all of them weren't, but there were some coming out of you know, they'd been staff folks for a long time and they hadn't been flying or whatever, they, whatever their job was, maintenance or whatever, and they'd come over and they were getting their ticket punched to get promoted. 
they were really hard to get along with because if you're out there as a, tacti a tactically proficient um, a captain, you expect your leadership to be pretty tactically proficient and have good judgment and wisdom and could offer you a lot of advice. And that, that happened sometimes. I was lucky in, in most of my cases. In other cases, it was not, not good at all. Uh, the Air Force took steps to fix that, and I don't think that is prevalent today. So I think you'll find, so for instance, when I was a numbered Air Force commander in, in Japan, so I was a three-star, uh, I, I, I had to fly the F-15. They made me fly the F-15, and, um, and I had to be a flight lead. That was a requirement, too. So you, you get all spooled up, and you do that. Um, I think that's a much better way. So the, the captains in the squadron, I might not have been as proficient with all the finger drills and all the switches, but I could fly as well as any of them, and my judgment in the air was, was uh, decent anyway. They wouldn't laugh at me in front of me. Uh, uh, decent. Uh, I think we've changed that culture uh, in the Air Force, so I think it has, to, it has to match. When I was in the fourth wing, we had a, um, a director of operations who liked to tell all the squadron commanders and all the captains what to do, but he, was, he never checked out as a flight lead, he never checked out as an instructor pilot, he had no credibility. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to lead, you've got to lead with credibility. And I hope our Air Force never goes back to, to allowing people to get in supervisory positions where you as a captain, lieutenant captain, major, are embarrassed by, by your leadership. Or you can't have this, I think I know where you're going, you can't have a, a good discussion or mentorship or whatever it is. So I think our Air Force is pretty squared away there. At least it was when I left it, and I'm, I doubt it to change it. So. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Get a second class Frost from CS11. So, books written by the Secret Service have said that George Bush was a very personable and nice president, whereas I feel like the general public sees George Bush as the cowboy in office. So, being the Joint Chief of Staff under George Bush, can you speak to personal relationships as well as those tough decision-making moments that you experienced with him? So, I think I, I'll tell you, I'll give you one. That's a great question. I'll give you one um, little incident that may, may help frame it all. Um, after the attacks of 9-11 on New York and Washington and Flight 93 and Pennsylvania, uh, we had our first, what I would call a National Security Council meeting in the basement of the Pentagon. They had a little bomb shelter down there. It wouldn't protect you against any bomb, but it was the big, thick doors and that sort of thing. I mean, it probably came about during the Cold War, but it wasn't, it wasn't, I mean, come on, it wasn't going to be very protective. But we're down there anyway, and we're having this National Security Council meeting, and this was just, just a, a day and a half after the attacks. The Pentagon still, there's still smoke coming out of the Pentagon. And at the end, he says, well, he said, this has been a great discussion. He says, I'm not sure what we're going to have to do to deal with this threat to make our country secure. But my guess is we're probably going to have to make decisions that will be unpopular in the country to our citizens. He said, if that's the case, we're going to make those decisions. And if that means I'm a one-term president, then so be it. Now, I don't know why that doesn't get a lot more. I mean, I took it down verbatim, and those words are essentially verbatim. Uh, I have it in a notebook at home. Um, that's the kind of guy... You, you can work for. That's the kind of person you can work for. And that was how the relationship went. Everything he did, you don't have to agree with any of the decisions, but, you, but he did them because he thought they were the right thing to do, and in his heart, he believed they were the right thing to do. And you can work for people like, like that. Uh, the rest of the relationship, um, when you're the senior military person, and you're dealing with the senior political folks, the, the president and the secretary of defense, um, I, uh, you can't let the relationship get too close, in my opinion. You have to keep a professional arm's length sort of relationship because we'll be having discussions where I won't agree and I'll, I'll, I'll disagree. And you, you want that to be professional and uh, not be co-opted by, by the friendship. Uh, I did let him recommend where to get a pair of cowboy boots made one time. Um, he was going through this big catalog of cowboy boots, and he bought new boots for every major international event. So if there's a big NATO heads of state meeting, he'd get new boots for that. Everything he did, new boots. And Rocky was his guy down in Houston, Rocky the bootmaker. And he says, Myers, Rocky's going to be at the White House two weeks from, the, from whatever. 
uh, get your secretary to call over, make sure we, you, you come over and you get your foot measured. He'll measure your foot, he'll talk about what you want. And on the way home, Mary Jo and I, I was talking to Mary Jo, I said, hey, I'm gonna be able to get some boots made by the president's boot maker. And, um, oh, by the way, I said, how much, they must cost an awful lot, Mr. President says, oh no, they're reasonable. So on the way home, we were talking about this, and Mary Jo says, what's reasonable to the Bush family might not be reasonable to the Myers family. <laughs> uh, so I let it go, and I'm hanging around the Pentagon one day, and my assistant says, the president called, he wants you over at the White House to get your foot measured. <laughs> and um, went over there, got my foot measure, I have a pair of Rockies boots, and uh, they are reasonable. Um, they're, they're okay. The other thing we did, we bet on uh, a K-State Texas football game. He's governor of Texas, didn't go to Texas, but uh, we bet. And when he left office, I got the dollar bill, $10 bill, $10 bill that went back and forth between us that held all the games on him, and we won our share, they won their share. He had it last. He said, this thing's been under my glass just to remind me of our relationship, and here's, here it is, and you can keep it. I thought that was pretty nice. So good human uh, and serving for the right reason, I would say. Maybe last question, I think. We're getting close. Somebody's got a hook, and I know they're going to come up and hook me. Uh, sir, with your vast knowledge on the Air Force and the joint mission, I mean, sorry, the military and the joint mission, do you foresee in the future a possible formation of a space branch and possible space academy uh, since our recent developments in science and technology? That's a good one, and we can, let's take a straw poll. No, we're not going to do it. <laughs> That's going to be debated for a while, I think. Um, I think I think the space domain has um, really played an important part, will play a more important part in the future, clearly. Uh, and so I think the more services you have, the I mean, it took, it took a, a congressional law to make the Army, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Navy work together. Congressional law to make us work together, and we still do okay. We don't do great. We do okay. Uh, and I've seen it up close and personal. I mean, it's just, I can take you into one of the, the worst operations, Operation Anaconda in, in Afghanistan. The Army had planned it. At the last minute, they said, oh, Air Force, you might, you might want to be in this planning. Duh. So, but they, we couldn't do it. The Air Force planners, the, the folks over in theater, didn't have time to get it right. Didn't just have the time. And uh, the result was we killed a lot of Americans and made heroes out of Americans that didn't need to be heroes if we'd had a really integrated air ground plan. We just didn't have one. And uh, it was the maddest I ever got in office. I called the CENTCOM commander Tommy Franks at the time, and it was a one-way conversation. I don't do this very often, but I said, Tommy, that was a disaster. I don't, I don't know how that could happen in this day and age. Uh, if it ever happens again, you're going to be short-lived. Now, bear in mind, he, he doesn't report to me. He reports to the Secretary of Defense, so I don't have the authority to fire him, but I know how to get him fired, so I know exactly who does that. So um, that really irritated me. So I think having another separate service or anything, I don't like that idea. More prominence, better education, uh, more tools, tools that are more widely known throughout the forces, because nobody's going to win it by themselves, back to whatever chart it was. You know, we, we can't do it well. We would like to think we can do it by ourselves, but it's, it's the integrated force that gets the job done. Space is just one of those integrating factors. And uh, so that's kind of where I would be on it. Uh, sir, if I may have a follow-up question, do you think the Air Force would by chance take that over then? I think the Air Force pretty much has, well, I realize every service has, um, has some part of the space mission, but the Air Force has the predominance, and um, it's expensive too, right? It competes with everything else, and so part of it is getting people in Congress, and there are a few, to realize the importance of the mission and pump our budget up so we can, we're the natural fit if anything like that were ever to happen, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, one more time, one more time before, there's the hook, thank you. Good up, Andermas. Thank you very much. But uh, certainly thank you. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, you're going into a unique, you're already part of a unique um, organization, a unique culture. Uh, remember, if you can, the three H's, if nothing else. You probably, you live all of those anyway. For those of your friends that don't have a sense of humor, start to tickle them, get them going. 
uh, this all, all of this kind of goes together to make you who you're going to be in the future. And I, I'll be cheering on the sidelines as you all take over our national security. Thank you very much.